Welcome to EPG Patshala. This paper is the philosophy of law. The current module is history of canon law. The objectives of this module are to understand the nature of canon law and the way that it developed over the course of history. This module was written by Garima Goswami, an independent research scholar in New Delhi. I am Akash Singh Rathor from the Lewis University of Rome. Canon law refers to a body of rules, some may say laws, that are accepted by the Christian church. The most sophisticated form is in the Catholic church, but Protestant churches also have their own various forms of canon law. Canon law is important because it survives till this day and also because of the influence that it has had in the last 1,000 years over the development of civil law or secular law. In fact, the, the influence that canon law has had over secular law is widely debated, but nobody denies that there has been an interchange between secular and civil law. What do we mean by canon law? Canon law refers to specifically theological legislation. So laws that are generated in conformity to the theology of uh, religious scripture. In this sense, you can understand Christian canon law as being analogous to the shariat in Islamic law or in uh, Jewish law. In this module, we're going to discuss some of the main uh, books that have uh, been promulgated that constitute what we refer to as the body or corpus of canon law. These books have been written from uh, mostly the 12th century up to the 20th century and have evolved slowly over that millennium. After we discuss these individual books, we'll discuss some of the debates that are undertaken on the relationship between canon law and secular law. Is canon law really law or is it just theology? Has secular law really been influenced by canon law or is it the other way around that secular law has influenced canon law? And in the conclusion, we will discuss one important aspect of this debate, which is the position of the German philosopher of law, Karl Schmitt, who suggests that, in fact, the nature of secular law is nothing but a secularized canon law. For all of these reasons, it's important in the philosophy of law to understand something about the history of canon law so you can decide for yourselves whether you think that canon law has been a dominating influence on secular law, including the laws that we promulgate in India, or whether you believe, as many others do, that it's just a domain of theology that has had some mild interaction with secular law, but hasn't influenced it too much. So that's the introductory part. So the word canon in canon law has its etymology in many languages. In Greek, the word is chanun. In Arabic, there's also a word chanun, uh, as well as khane in Hebrew. Interestingly, many of the languages that are etymologically unrelated, non-Indo-European languages, also have the origin of this term, kanon, kanun, chanan, kane, which in some way refers to the straightness, rightness, or correctness of some. Basically, the, the idea of the canon is the attempt to harmonize internal thoughts, or what was referred to as conscience, with external authority. So this kind of lining up of the internal with the external. What is the need for something like canon law? The need arises in all religions because religions are, are originate in a particular locale, a particular place, and the doctrines that come out from that particular place may not be perfectly suitable to all of the other climates or geographical conditions or social conditions where that religion spread. So in the case of Christianity, from the gospels or teaching of, uh, of Jesus to the, um, to the uh, doctrines of the apostles, as this uh, spread north, south, east, and west, many disagreements arose as to what exactly was meant when a particular uh, rule demanded, for example, to not eat a particular kind of food. Let's say there was absolutely no appearance of that food in that uh, region. It makes the law seem null or nonsense. Or let's say that the staple food in that region where the religion, in this case Christianity, is spreading, where the staple food is prohibited, this gives uh, rise to a lot of disagreements about exactly what is meant. And thus disagreements arose with the geographical spreading of the religion. 
Canon law has been defined in various ways throughout its history. The most current definition is one that attempts to take into account the various kinds of uh, concerns that canon law is not really law as we understand it in state law. What canon law is defined as then is the way through which the church regulates both internally and externally the activities of its congregation. So internally refers of course to the theology of uh, church doctrine and externally refers to the laws or the canon laws that are being uh, espoused or implemented. In order to be a member of a, of a church completely, you follow both internal and external declarations of that church. And that means that you abide by both the theology and the canon law of the Catholic Church. Different documents in history illustrate the development of canon law. We're going to look briefly at a few important collections over the past 1,000 years. And then we'll turn to the way that this vast history of canon law, this history of 1,000 years, has finally been systematized in the 20th century. We begin with Justinian's text. Most of early canon law, which developed simultaneously with ancient Roman law, was integrated into the legal system of Byzantium. So remember that uh, the, in the ancient world, Christianity developed uh, along with the Roman Empire, and that Roman Empire itself shifted over time from the west, or it, where we have it now in the Vatican in Rome, to the east, to an area that's referred to as Constantinople, now we know it as Istanbul. So Byzantium, or the Eastern Christian Empire, was the place where most of can early canon law developed in line with secular or Roman civil law. So as I've said, most of early canon law developed simultaneously with ancient Roman law, and it was integrated into the legal system of Byzantium. It was compiled by the order of the Byzantine emperor, whose name was Justinian, in the sixth century. So it was compiled by the emperor Justinian, em emperor of the sixth century Byzantium. And in this uh, uh, sixth century compilation, we already have at least three, if not more centuries of uh, the aggregation of the way that Roman law interacted with church doctrine. So Justinian's text, which was finally put together by the end of the sixth century, proved quite influential throughout all of the, of the uh, Christian, what would become known as the Holy Roman Empire or the Christianization of Europe under the authority of both local princes and the Vatican Church. After the uh, early Middle Ages, so starting from around the 11th, 11th century, 12th century onwards, it was required for clerics or members of the priestly community in Europe, not only to study theology, but also to study law. In the process of this acquisition of legal learning by the Catholic community throughout all of Europe, the doctrines of canon law became deeply integrated into the knowledge of the intelligentsia of the European uh, Christian community. The next collection of documents that we want to point to as uh, being very important occur in around the 11th century with what is referred to as the Gregarian Reform Movement. Now the Gregarian Reform Movement is a movement of a particular uh, community of Catholics referred to as the Gregorians who were in the process of determining the way that the uh, papacy should be considered supreme. In other words, the authority of the Pope should be considered supreme in relation to the secular authorities that existed throughout the European states. The Dictatus Papae is uh, Latin for the dictates of the Pope. There's a debate between scholars of whether it was actually written by Pope Gregory uh, or whether this Dictatus or this dictate of the Pope was uh, later inserted into the canon. What the point of this dictatus or this dictate is, is to establish the supremacy of the Pope. And as you establish the supremacy of the Pope over his rivals in the secular community, you're also thereby establishing the infallibility of canon law. So canon law in this respect, through the dictatus papi, has an authority higher than the secular law that would be practiced by the princes or the noblemen who ruled various parts of Europe. So in the 12th century, what we're seeing is the emergence of a difference or distinction between civil law and canon law that becomes more and more significant. And this plays out uh, over time. In the 12th century itself, we find through the work of the monk named Gracianus that 
we have to finally decide the relationship between canon law and secular or civil law. So now we move on to the third main document in canon law, which is referred to as the Decretum Graziani. Decretum uh, means decree, and Graziani means written by Gracianus, the 12th century monk. The Decretum Graziani was partly written by the monk Gracianus, and it was partly a collection of older material, including the Dictatus Papae and Justinian's text. The Decretum was later taken up as the first of six volumes representing the whole body of Catholic canon law, which developed from this period in the 12th century all the way up to 1918. The Decretum turns out to be the first volume of what over the next 700 years will be six total volumes making up the Catholic canon law. The Decretum was written to harmonize aspects of both civil and canon law. So through the Gregorian reform that we had experienced in the previous century, there were arguments over whether the Pope was supreme or whether the, the princes in the particular secular areas were supreme. What the Decretum does is that it finally harmonizes civil and canon law so we know what the relationship, what the proper relationship between them should be. This is referred to as the harmony of civil and canon law. And the Decretum states it like this that civil law is to be followed in all matters, not specifically defined within the canon law. So what this means is that it, wherever there is no canon law, wherever there is an argument over the meaning of canon law or whether it should be applied, the civil law, rather than any kind of local custom, should be the thing that intercedes. And what this serves to do is in the process of deciding what the canon law should be, it serves to strengthen civil law throughout uh, the European secular lands. Now we move on to the Liber Extra and the Liber Sextus. We're still in the 12th century, moving to the 13th century. What happens is that between 1188 and 1226, various popes had issued five papal decrees. So papal decrees are decrees or texts written by the pope that are authoritative throughout Christendom. These five papal decrees were collected by Pope Gregory IX into a book that was referred to as the Liber Extra. Now, Liber Extra means the book with extra. Why is it extra? It's extra because it contains various uh, bodies of canon law, or canons as they're referred to, that are well beyond the decretum that was created by Gracianus. So the Liber Extra, what we get is the decretum of Gracianus that was built upon the works of the Byzantine Empire's Justinian manuscript and later papal decrees mixed with the five decrees issued throughout the 12th century. What this Liber Extra does then is to create five books of canon law that will prove to be uh, crucial for the next six centuries of European legislation. In 1298, a sixth book was added, and this is referred to as the Liber Sextus. That just means six book. This was added to the Liber Extra. In this Liber Sextus, we get one of the first articulations of a very important principle of natural law, which is included in uh, many contemporary debates, and it runs like this. What touches all should be approved by all. What touches all should be approved by all. So what this suggests is that the very earliest formulations of natural law that are common in procedural law today begin to appear or emerge through the 11th, 12th, and 13th century construction of the six books of canon law. Now, after discussing the emergence of the six books of canon law, we are going to talk about the philosopher Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas is one of the most well-known uh, and famous philosophers and theologians in the Christian uh, world, and he was uh, influenced not only by the philosophy of Aristotle, which was coming out through Latin translations from Spain, but also through the uh, papal decrees and papal and the theology that was emerging through the papal decrees. In the philosophy and theology of Thomas Aquinas, he wrote a very important section of the Summa Theologica, his major work, which was referred to as the treatise on law. In this treatise, Aquinas argues that law can be divided into basically four forms. One is the eternal law, one is the divine law, one is the uh, human law, and uh, one is the natural law. Now this distinction of law into four forms 
rather introduces a more complex system than the one between canon law and civil law. The, the teachings of Thomas Aquinas were, in the time that he was writing these works, considered quite uh, radical, and there was an e even an inquisition over whether Thomas Aquinas was fully orthodox or whether he was committing a kind of heterodoxy. Later history establishes the centrality of Thomas Aquinas. In the 19th century, Pope Leo XIII released the encyclical letter called Aeterni Patris. Aeterni Patris is Latin for the Eternal Father. And in the Aeterni Patris, the Pope suggests that from that moment on, wherever philosophy or theology is taught in the Catholic world, and remember by the 19th century, the Catholic world covers most of the globe, wherever philosophy and theology is taught, the teachings of Thomas Aquinas will be regarded as the dogma. In other words, will be regarded as the ultimate teaching and everyone Every priest, every philosopher, and every theologian must conform his teaching to that of Thomas Aquinas. Most of Aquinas' work attempted to establish the truth of the Christian faith by taking recourse to reason. So, for instance, in his work, the Summa Contra Gentilis, Summa Contra Gentilis means the work against the non-Christian. Aquinas addressed his argument to the non-Christian reader. Now, obviously, a non-Christian reader won't believe in the doctrines of the Catholic Church, so he has to persuade them not by theology, but by rationality. And I'll quote from the Summa Contra Gentilis. My purpose is to declare the truth which the Catholic faith professes. But here I must have recourse to natural reason, since the Gentiles do not accept the authority of the scripture. Natural reason, however, is deficient in the things of God. It can prove some parts of the faith, but not others. Whatever is demonstrable is, so far as it goes, in accordance with the Christian faith, and nothing in Revelation is contrary to reason. In the process of discussing the treatise on law in the Summa Theologica, Aquinas' main work on law, Aquinas defines law as follows. Nothing other than an ordinance of reason for the common good made by him who has the care of the community and promulgated. So let me repeat this definition of law because it's very important in relation to the definition that we had heard in the previous module, module two, that of John Austin, which is that the law is the uh, command of the sovereign issued uh, uh, and backed by uh, a sanction. Instead of this positive conception of law that we see in Austin, Aquinas defines it as nothing other than an ordinance of reason for the common good. So you can see a distinction here between the positive conception of law as a command backed by a sanction issued by a sovereign, in contrast to this theologically inspired notion of law, which is that law is an ordinance of reason for the common good. Here we begin to see in Thomas Aquinas's conception already emerging as a sort of argument between the natural law positions and the positive law positions like we had discussed in the previous module, module two. Now, about these four kinds of law that I had mentioned, the eternal law, the natural law, human law, and divine law, Aquinas maintains that since reason is a coextension of God, natural law is a reflection or a participation in God's eternal law. So God is the legislator of the eternal law. Natural law, however, forms a subset of eternal law. Natural law is that subset or that part of eternal law that is applicable to human beings who are guided by free will and governed by reason. It's noteworthy that the natural law theory of Aquinas does not exclude positive law. He calls it human law. Now human law, or what we call today positive law, cannot be unjust. According to Aquinas, positive laws have to follow from natural law in order to be just, and in that respect, they also flow in some sense from the eternal law of God. Now, if that's the relationship of the eternal law, natural law, and positive law, what is divine law? Aquinas says that divine law is the law promulgated in the words of the Pope. So as we've been talking all along, that the Pope issues decrees or dictats or dictatus, um, these constitute, according to Aquinas, the divine law. And I'll quote from Aquinas how he summarizes this. So I, I've discussed the relationships between divine law, natural law, human law, and eternal law. Let's see how Aquinas summarizes. Aquinas says, human law has the nature of law insofar as it partakes of right reason 
And it is clear that in this respect, it is derived from eternal law. But insofar as it deviates from reason, it is called an unjust law and has the nature not of law, but of violence. Nevertheless, even an unjust law, insofar as it retains some appearance of law, through being framed by one who is in power, is derived from the eternal law, since all power is from the Lord God, as it states in the Book of Romans. So thus far, we have discussed a number of books from the 6th century Byzantium through to 11th, 12th century uh, uh, Europe, in other words, Rome, the dictates of the Pope, and the movements of the creation, uh, slow creation of canon law from a series of statements by Byzantine uh, authorities, what are referred to as synods, to the collection of the decrees of the Pope, papal decrees, through the writings of monks like Gratianus. And in this process, over several hundred years, we get a collection, finally, of six books that are referred to collectively as the corpus or body, the corpus of canon law. Now, this corpus of canon law, then, is supplemented by the philosophy and theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. And what you find is, by the 20th century, the popes are interested in codifying all of canon law, unifying it, and harmonizing it, so that instead of having it uh, expressed through different kinds of works from different centuries, different origins, different civilizations, the entire corpus or the entire body of canon law will be systematized rigorously for the entire global Catholic Church. And this movement began in the uh, earliest, uh, in the first decade of the 20th century. So by around 1910, 1911, it was decided that all of these various documents that we've been discussing, as well as the theology and philosophy of Thomas Aquinas, will be systematically uh, uh, transformed into one book. In 1917, finally, the first code of canon law was promulgated. It was called the Codex Juris Canonici. So Codex means code, Juris Canonici refers to the canon law. So we get in 1917, the Codex Juris Canonici, or the Code of Canon Law, that was finally implemented in 1918. What this Codex, or Code, did was it strengthened the Catholic Church externally and internally. For example, in dealing with concordats, now concordats are treaties between the church and the state, it defined the proper relationship between church and state. So each power, whether it was the state authority or the church authority, knew exactly what could be expected from the Catholic Church in these treaties. Now, while this Codex of 1918 was extremely important for serving to strengthen the Church and its doctrines, it had one fatal flaw. And the fatal flaw was that it was designed primarily for an audience of scholars and priests, rather than for the millions and millions of laymen who were under the authority of the Church. So it seems strange in this respect to have the entire body of Catholic canon law, which regulates the activities of hundreds of millions of people around the world, to be written in a form that is somewhat inaccessible to anyone unless you are an educated priest or a specialist or a theologian or a lawyer. So this codex that was implemented in 1918 eventually was seen as outdated. And during the process of Vatican II reforms, for example, in the late uh, 50s and early 60s, Pope John XXIII expressed his wish to revise the Codex of Canon Law. This process began in 1963, and it took two decades. By the mid-1980s, the second, and what is known as the current Codex, was created. And this is much simpler than the 1918 Codex. The second, or the current Codex, again code, contains merely 1,752 canons, or rules, or laws. It also contains several rules and regulations that were of utmost importance to laymen, not just to jurists, lawyers, and theologians. In 1990, Pope John Paul II publicized a distinct document for the Eastern Churches, which in Latin is called the Codex Canonum Ecclesiarium Orientalium. In other words, the Code of Canon Law for the Oriental or the Eastern Churches. So this includes India's Catholic Church as well. What this is meant to do is to harmonize the Code of Catholic Law that is uh, originating out of Rome 
to harmonize that with the canon law followed by all of the Eastern churches around the world, the churches in Africa, the churches in Asia, and so on. This united canon law has been updated and developed with major revisions in 2010. So the very most current idea is that today the global Catholic Church stands united under one all-encompassing canon law. Now that we've discussed the history and the emergence and the development of can canon law all the way up to the 20th century and in fact 2010 where canon law gets fully integrated all over the world in a global church, the question obviously arises, what is the importance of this for us? We as philosophers of law, why do we need to look at a particular religious uh, law and the way that it developed over time? Well, this is widely debated. The argument is that canon law has influenced and interacted with the development of secular law throughout the last millennium. So a secular country with laws that were uh, modeled on either British common law or various aspects of, of European jurisprudence like the Indian Constitution, nevertheless, according to this argument, have a great many traces or influences of that evolution of canon law that we have referred to. The most clear example for us is the introduction of principles of natural justice that are so common to Indian legal practices. In other words, in an Indian courtroom, you must uh, always present the, the, uh, the litigants. This is referred to as habeas corpus, having the body, showing the body, showing the person under charge. This very crucial and important practice in Indian legislation itself derives from an early Catholic code, an, an, er, an early Catholic uh, uh, canon, which demands habeas corpus in any act of litigation. In other words, if I should challenge or accuse somebody, the person whom I challenge or accuse should be present for that accusation so that ultimately he or she has the possibility of defending himself. So what we take as a crucial aspect of the contemporary practice and the nature of law in India ironically turns out to date in some very crucial respects to between the 6th and 12th century development of the understanding of law in the Catholic Church. For this reason, we think it's rather important to discuss the nature and history of canon law so that we can see what and where it has influenced contemporary secular law. But the debate surrounds how much influence there really is. On the one hand, some scholars argue that canon law influenced very mildly, very weakly or dimly the emergence of secular law, which has its own important history that we should understand free of the church. On the other hand, certain uh, scholars argue that Catholic law and canon law are crucial to almost every conception that we entertain within civil law. For example, the idea of freedom that is, or liberty that is so important to contemporary secular law actually derives from the concept of the salvation of the soul from from earlier theological doctrine. So there are two sides to this debate, that canon law has a great deal of influence or that canon law has a very uh, uh, narrow field of influence. We're going to discuss first a compromise position on how we can understand this and then move on to the position of Carl Schmitt who represents in some respects the most important uh, interpreter of the relationship of canon and state law. The compromise position in the debate on canon law brings religion and law together. It does so through the discipline of what's called practical theology, and I'll quote what, this, what, what the meaning of this is. Theology without law leaves the ecclesiastical community bereft of an ordered life. Law without theological meaning surrenders its moral persuasiveness and deteriorates into rigid legalism. So what the argument in this compromise position is that whatever the historical relationship of canon and secular law, it's clear that both need one another. The contemporary formulation of this, as we had seen in module two, is in the argument against positive law, that positive law cannot be completely self-referential but must refer to something outside of it if it's to make any moral sense whatsoever. And that is, of course, what is referred to as natural law or in this case, as we've been arguing, 
the origins of natural law can be found in the development of canon. Now, before we move on to our conclusion, we have to discuss a unique position running alongside this debate of the significance of canon law to secular law. And it's, it was introduced by the most famous German jurist of the 20th century, Karl Schmitt, in his very famous and important book, Political Theology. Now, Schmitt presents an extreme view which makes canon law significant in the political theory of contemporary nation states. According to Schmidt, canon, the canon law of Roman Catholicism forms not just uh, various aspects of the legal order, but it forms the very concept of the modern nation state. And parallels can be drawn between the structure of the canon law and the implementation of the structure of law in the modern nation state as such. So for example, the Pope in the Catholic Church or in canon law is akin to the sovereign, you can think of the president or the prime minister, in civil law. And the canon laws are secularized into civil legislation. In another example, just as God has the power of performing miracles in the church, the sovereign, like our prime minister, enjoys the exceptional powers to override the constitution and, for example, declare a state of emergence. So according to Schmidt, every theory of the modern nation state is in fact a secularized version of theological principles. So Carl Schmidt argues that it's not a case where we're debating whether canon law had an influence on secular law or secular law had an influence on canon law. Carl Schmidt's very radical and important position espoused in his political theology is that every single legal concept we have in the modern nation state is just a secularized version of theology. So let's summarize. Although canon law originated in a particular attempt to harmonize apostolic or the practice of the apostles of Jesus Christ, apostolic doctrines or demands, to harmonize those apostolic demands with the, the geographical dispersion of Christian uh, religion. It served over the course of the last two centuries to spread into a full relationship, a fully blossoming relationship as a kind of legal order for all of the Catholic Church. So it begins very small in a particular place. How do you harmonize something that Jesus said in this place and time with certain practices that are going on elsewhere in the world. This is the, the small origin of canon law. And by 2010, it comes to be a comprehensive body of law that covers the entire global Catholic Church, both Eastern and Western. So what is it that Indian Christians should practice? What is it that Roman Catholic Christians should practice? All of these issues are comprehensively contained in codexes or codes of canon law that control the entire Catholic Church uh, the world over. In the process of moving from this small local uh, practice to an entire global comprehensive order, the canon law has also interacted with and fed into secular law. So the way that secular law has itself developed from Roman times to the contemporary order that we have in every nation st state in each of the 210 or 11 nation states that we have in the world today, they are all organized under a body of law. Now the argument in this module has been that the way that the nation state is organized under its body of law has been influenced by the way that canon law developed over time. The debate has been whether this influence has been a very deep influence so that secular law is embroiled in theological principles from canon law, or whether the influence has been a mild one, where just various natural law principles of canon law have been adopted into the legal regimes of contemporary nation states. This debate is for you to decide. In this module, we have gone over many of the grounds to allow you to make the decision of whether canon law forms the basis of contemporary secular law and the nation state, or has just informed it through principles of natural justice. Thank you.